Okay, as in go. Sorry, one second. Fork Tales, a podcast that feeds the food and beverage world. Oh, awesome. Fork Tales is brought to you by Vigor, a branding and marketing agency for passion driven, innovative restaurant, beverage, and hospitality brands. Learn more at vigorbranding.com. If you love what we're serving up, please give Fork Tales a five star review on your podcast service of choice. Think of it as a tip for good service. Gino's Pizzeria and D'Angelo Sub Sandwiches. Uh, if you're from the Northeast, you know those names. Um, if you're not from the Northeast, you're about to learn a bit more about them. Before we dive in, Kevin, say hello. Give a little bit of backstory. Yeah, hey, Joseph. Thanks for having me on. Just a quick correction. It's actually Kevon. It's French. Oh, Kevin. No, I'm just totally kidding. <laughs> I didn't see the <laughs> accent kidding. mark. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, thanks for having me on. I'm really excited to join you and uh, have this discussion. As Joseph mentioned, I'm the VP of tech. Give you a quick backstory. I know we're going to dive into my story a little bit, so I'll keep it really high level. Born and raised on the West Coast in California, um, was convinced to go to school in Chicago at Northwestern to play football. Don't ask me how they got a kid from the sunny California West Coast to go to the Midwest where it was cold and raining and snowing all the time. But they got me there, had a great time at Northwestern, um, played 10 years in the NFL, went back, got my MBA from Rice, a master's in technology from Northwestern, and actually preparing for my doctorate at USC in organizational leadership. Yeah, I'm a glutton for pain when it comes to education, so uh, don't fault me too much. I love that. Yeah, I mean, the professional journey and then and then the, um, the academic journey as well is really interesting to see happen. Um, so you did start as a, well, I would say start, but you you had a stint, uh, a long stint in the NFL playing for a number of teams, but then you forayed into this restaurant world, um, which I find really interesting uh, because a lot of times, at least the NFL players that I know, and I do know some, believe it or not, um, <laughs> they, they didn't really do that. I see a lot of NFL players go from NFL and then some go into uh, commentary uh, or become personalities, um, e- even if they weren't a, a star, um, t- to say the least. Um, and, and rare do I see NFL leaders going into actually leadership of, uh, companies that I would consider not ancillary to the sports world. Um, so your restaurant industry experience started with Inspire Brands. Now you're at Papa Gino's. Oh, and you're also a snowboard instructor for those that are yep. wondering. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what benefits and unique insights uh, have been empowered and fueled by those various roles and experiences, both professionally and academically? Yeah, so really, I would say the biggest benefit of the eclectic background is being able to fit in any environment. Um, I think we had a chance to meet in Vegas at Mertech. Mm-hmm. And right off the bat, you'd have thought you and I were friends for some time. And that's just because I'm, I've had so many different experiences. It allows me to connect with people naturally and organically. And I think that's a huge benefit that people in today's society don't really leverage is that connection piece, right? And it's always that old adage, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Yep. And you get to know people through connections. So I think my background really lends itself well to the ability to connect with people from all walks of life. Um, and I think that's a strong suit of mine. <clears throat> the The football piece really allowed me to hone in some leadership skills, some soft skills that are really hard to come by. Um, and corporate covers those kind of skills, which we develop naturally over time, right? You're forced into a locker room with 60 different guys from all across the world, different walks of life. And oh, by the way, we need to go win games and figure out how to work together to be successful. And so Um, Those soft skills really are what led me to really dive deeper into the path of leadership. As I mentioned, I'm going to work on my PhD in organizational leadership. I think there's a gap in corporate, what people believe are true leaders, 
versus what corporate looks at leadership as. And to me, it is a leadership in corporate really is someone who is a SME in one area that becomes a leader, but they don't really understand how to manage and connect with people. And so yeah. I think I think the background really lends itself to some of those soft skills. Yeah, if you could give, um, maybe let's dig into the reality or, or the behind the scenes look at professional sports, specifically the NFL. Because, you know, as a fan, uh, as a Las Vegas Raiders fan, for those that do not know, uh, one of the biggest in Atlanta, I'd like to think. Um, it's easy as a fan to watch the TV any given Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Um, and what you see, I would say, is pretty rudimentary. But in the locker room, working as a team, I think there's a lot more that goes on, uh, especially, like you said, helping you uh, hone those skills to build teams that are diverse, um, not just racially, but culturally and even, um, you know, mentality wise. What does that look like? How do you even begin to collect a group of people like that together? And what role did you play in that? Yeah, that's interesting. So early in my career, I was just trying to fit in, right? You're as a rookie, it's be seen, not heard. <laughs> and right. so you just try to fit in, you're trying to learn the playbook and and earn the team your other team members respect. And that's really where it starts is at the respect level, right? So you come in, you work hard, you show what you can do, you show you're willing to go the extra mile, and guys start to embrace that because we are all there for one common goal, which is to win the Super Bowl, right? Mm -hmm. There's there's nothing else that really matters. Yeah, you want to win games, but the ultimate goal is to come together to win a Super Bowl. You only get 16 chances to do that in a regular season, and you get four chances depending on where you fall in the playoffs. Right. So it's a really short window to come together collectively and do the best you can each week to win. And so for me, early on in my career, like I said, it was really about fitting in. In my second year, I became a starter, so more responsibility. But with that responsibility, now you're worried about yourself, but you're also worried about bringing the guys behind you along. Because if I were to get hurt, I need the guy behind me to play well in my absence. Not too well, because then I wouldn't get my spot back, but you know, well enough to keep us going. Um, right. And so I really embraced that kind of role early on in my career, which is helping develop the guys behind me. I share the story a lot. There were guys that were way more talented than me, way more experienced, and probably should have beat me out. But based on my understanding of the playbook and my ability to help bring guys along, it kept me in the NFL for 10 years. Yeah, learning that playbook is is incredibly important. And I don't think a lot of people understand that, especially sports fans, for instance. But there is a direct correlation to especially the restaurant industry in that we have playbooks. We, we have training. Yep. We have <laughs> operational manuals. And yet you'll still find people that want to go rogue or uh, want to go Antonio Brown on that. Um, and, and just be rock stars. And I don't like the way our tacos are made. I want to put extra spice on it. Um, and so it, it makes a lot of sense. I, I think one thing that I've picked up from your CV and also being able to talk to you, not only in Vegas, but um, throughout our work together. So full transparency, um, Vigor is working on the Papa Gino's website. So there is uh, another connection there to Kevin, not just uh, a colleague and a friend. Um, but one thing that I think that really threads everything together that you do is this determination to succeed and not just individually, but as a team. Um, how do you bring that to the table and help elevate that same determination within the teams in your charge? Uh, not, not only in your charge, but also parallel to you. Yeah. So I'll use uh, Papa Gino's as a great example. Um, <clears throat> so when I came in as the VP, I had a, a, I inherited a department that was pretty much leaderless for about eight to nine months. And I came in with a set of values, cores and beliefs. We talked about those beliefs, but then I brought the team along for the journey. I wanted to hear what they what they thought, what they expected of leadership, what their vision was for the company, and then how we collectively bring that together to move the company forward. It was interesting because when I first started talking about this team mentality, for whatever reason, you know, corporate to me is a me, 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 I, I, I type environment. If you want to get promoted and those type of things, it's to kind of beat your chest mentality and I've never been able to do that sports really beats that mentality out of you you know it's when you when you win it's the team did great when it's when we lose it's I could have done a lot more to help us win 
And so my team was skeptical, to be honest, that I was going to put action to the words that I was telling them, right, in terms of helping getting them promoted, help getting them raises and visibility. And fast forward five months in, almost six months in, my team is singing my praises. They're like, I can't believe you're still putting on this dog and pony show and doing the things you said you're going to do. And I said, hey, guys, listen, it isn't a dog and pony show. It's who I am. And it's at the core. I believe if we all win together, we'll win individually. And I'm going to do my best to continue to promote from internally, um, get you visibility across the business. And we started to actually bridge the gap with the business. You know, IT and the business usually operates in separate silos. Mm -hmm. And I, I dispelled that right away because in order for us to help the business move forward. We have to understand the objective, the goals and things like that. So my team's in every meeting, IT rate, uh, related or business related. And we're seeing the fruits of that with some of the things we've been able to initiate in the IT department. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a brilliant first step. And I think what, what's great about you coming in here fresh is you're not already beaten down by uh, what could be corporate politics. Not saying Papa Gino has that, but most most organizations do. You, you yep. have the old guard that's been in there for a while. They have tried to do something. They've gotten beaten down for whatever reason. And then they end up just stagnating and they don't want to even put in the effort anymore. But putting technology, actually taking technology out of its silo, it's like, no, no, no. Technology is actually literally a part of every single department in this organization. <laughs> and so you either have a say in this. Or, or the technology is going to steamroll you and you're going to be you're going to be pretty pissed off. I mean, we're seeing I mean, right now, the tech world, I, I don't need to tell you, but for those that are listening, I mean, pretty much every challenge within the restaurant industry is being tackled by a tech company right now. So we just had yeah. Brian Hassan from Kickfin on doing amazing things with tipping out and gratuity. Um, we have coming up Ellis Wynn Stanley, or it may have aired by the time this airs. Um, who, who's leading the charge with Axial Shift, which is basically pulling managers out of that little tiny hole in the wall and getting them on the floor again. Um, everything, everything. And, and so if you don't have leaders in these silos, understanding that, embracing it, and then finding a, an ally, not someone that wants to encamp, but an ally in someone like yourself, that, that's going to get a lot of great movement forward. Um, yeah, I think uh, one of the benefits for me is later in my days at Inspire, I was really, I was actually on the operations team. Okay. And so that really opened my eyes, you know, and I had worked with operations in the past, but being on that team and inundated with operations day to day really opened my eyes to how we really need each other to succeed. And while I had a tech lens, I was an operator. And at the at the core, there's two people that we really serve: the operators that keep our restaurants open, mm -hmm. and the customer, right? And meeting that customer where they are in their journey. And I keep those two things top of mind, regardless of what I'm working on. And I think it's in that order too: operator, yeah. then the customer. <laughs> and, and a lot of people yeah. think the customers first, but it's like no. If you don't treat the operators well, if you don't equip them well, the customer's never going to have a great experience. Um, you have yeah, to it's sure uh, <laughs> it's interesting you say that because I'm an avid reader and there's a book called Lead with Love by the only woman CEO of Southwest Airlines. Oh, wow. And okay. she speaks a lot about this topic. Your number one customer are your employees. If they're not happy, no one's happy. No one's getting the experience that you want to have. And That's so right. the operator is detrimental and key to the success of the restaurant and making sure your guests have the experience that you set out. That's right. Um, so let's talk about Papa Gino's. Um, for those that don't know, Papa Gino's, is, it's a Boston-based or a Massachusetts-based company. Um, they have a huge footprint in that Northeastern area, the New England area. Um, and, and I hate to use the C word, but there's something of a cult. I mean, you say Papa Gino's to anybody that's either been to Boston <laughs> or born and raised in Boston. They're like, Papa Gino's is where it's at. Um, ha had you come into contact with the brand prior to taking up your post and and – what do you think is the secret sauce to this brand being so cultish, for, for lack of a better term? Yeah, so I had not in, come across the brand prior to going up to visit and do my interview process, but I will say it is definitely a cult. No matter where I go across the country, if I meet someone from the Northeast or I tell them where I work, and they're like, oh my God, I grew up on the brand. I love the number nine. The pizza's great. I'm like... <laughs> 
Whoa, whoa, whoa. You sound like a Laker fan because we're a cult too, but <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but but yeah, it's um it's amazing the love and respect this brand has. And at the core, it started as a neighborhood pizzeria sandwich joint right back in the 60s. So it's been around for quite some time. But I think what keeps people coming back is the quality of food. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've, I've worked at a number of fast food uh, restaurant companies. I will say the pizza is phenomenal. The sandwiches are amazing. Um, and this isn't a plug for them because I work for them. The food is actually really good. And I think at the core, as long as you continue to deliver quality food and a quality experience, that coat will continue. I mean, I've met people that, oh, I grew up on that brand since I was five. My kid, We used to go there after our games and eat and have pizza and stuff like that. And it's like, wow, they really have something special up here in the Northeast. Yeah, and, and something about that brand, you know, because it's been around for so long, um, it becomes a very uh, delicate and sensitive scenario when you're trying to usher it forward, when you're trying to continue yeah. to help evolve it, because you have to maintain the magic that's there. You have to maintain enough um, basis so you don't alienate the ones that love a certain Papa Gino's, but instead just reinforce that love as time goes on. So as you're thinking about technology, how much of that is in the back of your mind? How much of it is, yes, we're going to embrace this this new technology, but it's going to bolster, accentuate, and build upon that that goodwill that we already have. Um, are there lots of discussions around that? Oh, yeah. It, 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 I'll give you a perfect example. We're exploring AI, as many people are probably in the industry, both in drive through and answering phones in store. And one of the big hangups for us is, the brand is used to having a person with that strong New England, Boston accent. <laughs> and how do we combat that to make sure we're getting the technology forward, but not losing the essence of the brand? And so we've decided to actually go in with a person first just to see what the response is and how our guests are reacting to that experience. I don't know if we'll ever get to AI because of that neighborhood feel, right? That yeah. doesn't lend itself well to what our brand stands for. But we're trying to push that forward while being mindful of the brand's essence. And I wouldn't even say it's in the back of our mind. It's at the forefront. Um, and if you, you know Dina, she yeah. continues to push that as well. Well, Kevin, great idea. But how does that fit into our neighborhood concept? <laughs> and so yeah, she's, we're she's really... She's a good uh, protector of the brand in that way. Um, yeah, we're really mindful of that. Yeah, that's amazing. So I, I have this vision in my head of a Bostonian teaching... Uh, sorry, y'all, this is going to be a gross stereotype, but a room full of like <laughs> Indian and Bangladeshi uh, and Sri Lankan uh, people, how to speak with the accent. Um, I don't know if you recall, but there was a bunch of advertisements uh, 10 years ago at this point, I'm sure, for uh, uh, a product called The Hopper, which uh, I think it was through Comcast, which allowed you to like record videos and or, uh, TV and blah, 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 blah. Again, it's very old, y'all. Um, <laughs> but there was a guy <laughs> teaching... Uh, people how to speak with a Bostonian accent. And one of my favorite lines was, you put your khakis in your khakis and not the other way around. You know, so car keys <laughs> in your khaki yeah. pants. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it was pretty great. So I imagine a similar scenario with uh, trying to get a, a, a call center up to speed on a neighborhood feel. Yeah, and um, you know, it's interesting because <laughs> you dropped the R the first time you said car keys. Up yeah. there, they don't use ours for whatever reason. It's lobster. And yeah. I'm like, lobster? They're like, no, lobster. I'm like, where's the R in that? <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> but it is a unique uh, dialect. You know, I think you and I are both here in the South, and we have our own slang or twang, if you sure. will. We use y'all a lot and that kind of stuff. And they're like, well, you sound extra country. I'm like, <laughs> Have you heard yourself speak? Yeah. <laughs> Let me record you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love that. One of my favorite down here is y'alls. The, the plural y'all. Yeah. The plural y'alls. Like y'all isn't enough. No, there's yeah. more than y'all. <laughs> y'alls is the top. <laughs> but, but it's funny because Bostonians will swear they do not have an accent. Yeah. What, what do you mean? I don't have an accent. They get all uptight. I'm like... You really haven't heard yourself speak. You, you yeah. probably should record yourself. <laughs> yeah, you're tone deaf. Uh, come yeah. On. <laughs> I love it. Well, I need to I need to get serious now. Um, 
I question whether or not I should even ask this question because I know it can be very sensitive to a lot of people. <sighs> Pineapple on pizza or no? Ooh. Moment of I silence. I know. I'm probably going to get crucified for my answer here. I am a pineapple on pizza type guy. That's one of right. my favorite one of my favorite pizzas <laughs> is a pineapple pizza and I just sometimes I replace the ham with chicken. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> but I yeah. love pineapple on pizza. I'm it a is, huge pineapple on pizza guy too. Anyone that yeah, argues it tastes that fruit shouldn't be on pizza. I'm like, "Bro, tomatoes are fruit." The end. <laughs> like, <laughs> they go hand in hand, my friend. Yeah. Sweet and savory, they're best friends. They are yeah, best it friends. Yeah, it, it just adds that little touch of sweetness and then the crunch from the uh, pineapple, right? If you get the right pineapple mm. and it's not soggy, it, it gives that pizza just a delicate touch that can't be beat. Anyone who doesn't yeah. try pineapple on pizza is insane. And that's probably why they don't go and eat it because they've never tried it. Because if they have it, it would become a part of their day, their their normal eating habits. That's right. I love it with uh, <laughs> jalapenos on it. You know, yeah, and I'll give so it the little spice. spice, the kick. You got that. There's like pops of sweet in there. The whole thing. That's magic yeah. to me, man. It doesn't get much better than that. You know, I'm like glad when we you think about yeah, like when you think about a chocolate chip cookie, right? People put sugar in it and now they're sprinkling salt you're like well it's supposed to be a sweet cookie but that that balance is the same thing i look at i think about pineapple on pizza that's right yeah yep. if, if you all haven't <laughs> tried it and you're trying to be a hater fine you can hold on to your hater aid all you want go try a pineapple pizza it's so good and i don't care and look this is coming from someone who's part sicilian so i have a stake in the game you know what i mean like i don't care what you say pineapple belongs on pizza i'm with you 100 percent allies <laughs> i agree with the pizza part but talk about stereotypes <laughs> sicilian yeah, right pizza. <laughs> that's I think right you just <laughs> stamp of approval <laughs> that's right i speaking on behalf of all sicilians we approve it <laughs> now who's going to get crucified, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's hop down. Let's talk about more about this technology stuff. That is what is in your purview. That is what, what you're leading the charge with. Um, suffice to say, the tech revolution in this industry is in full swing. Um, how have you approached identifying the right partners at Papa Gino's to ensure this brand is poised to grow uh, with tech as its backbone? What are the, some of the elements that you're looking for in a partner um, and when I, when I say partner, I mean like tech uh, solutions. I just, I hate the word solutions. Yep. Well, I, I, but I think you actually hit the nail on the head by saying partner because the, the rate at which technology is moving, you actually need a strategic partner that's going to come along with you for the journey. You build a roadmap together and things of that nature. So I'm really looking at vendors long-term and how we could be strategic together because, and I use this all the time. I may be smart in technology today, but I'm going to be dumb tomorrow because that's the rate it's moving at, right? And and I'm not going to know it all. My vendors aren't going to know it all. So it has to really be a partnership. And yeah. then the second piece is I really understand operationally what our operators need to be more efficient, how we can automate certain tasks. And then what the get and the third piece is what where's the guest at in the journey? Is it in store? Is it is it curbside? Is it 3PD? Is it delivery? And what technologies will enable the guests to have the best experience? You know, yeah. when we were probably growing up, we were brand loyal, right? Whether the brand sucked or not, if we we're loyal, we we're going to keep going there. Yeah, I'm a Raiders fan, so yes. Yeah, yeah, so you know, you haven't won in forever, in ages, <laughs> <That's> right? right. <laughs> I feel like that as a Laker fan right now, too, by the yeah. way. I'm it's not used to building. losing and not making playoffs, yeah. It makes us stronger inside. That's right. I'm, I'm, I'm really crying inside, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but the customer today is fickle. They want things the way they want it, when they want it, and how they want it. And if you don't deliver that, they're on to the next, right? And so loyalty becomes a big piece of that in the data, but really understanding your consumer. That is critical to what moves the needle, right? Like, AI might not be for everybody. Mm -hmm. Digital menu boards might not be for everyone, right? So you got to understand your consumer base and what they're looking at. 
for instance, when I was at Inspire, we were digital everything. We were heavily pushing digital. And a neighborhood brand like Peace, like Papa John's or D'Angelo's, it's like, whoa, that's way too much. What happened to our natural feel? And if you've ever been to Boston, the architecture and the buildings, you don't know who's if it's a house, if it's a restaurant, if it's, yeah. and all that blends together. And so you have to be mindful of that, right? And going back to your earlier point of keeping the brand essence at front of mind. Um, but yeah, we're looking at all technology, just like everyone else. I go to conferences all the time. I've been appointed to a couple of boards, advisory boards, which is good for me because now I get firsthand information. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, you know, it's coming down the pike. Yeah. You know, one of the things that, that is really top of mind for me is the ability for these platforms to talk to each other. Your sales guy will say they can. Integrations. Yeah. Yeah. Just (laughs) integrating in general right now just seems to be this. um, It seems to have been not the the front and center of what they've built. Now, a lot of systems have been backfilled built or they add the API after the fact. Um, but it's, it's extremely ineffective. And I, I see a lot of these the behemoths trying to clamor to catch up with that. How much of a headache is integration still compared to maybe a few years ago? It is a huge, huge headache, right? And it's, have you ever seen The Lion King? Yeah. <laughs> you know when he says, Mufasa, ooh, say it again, say it again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's how I feel about it when we say the word integration. It's like, yeah. ooh, because... <laughs> Everyone will swear they have an, an open API. And then when you start digging into the weeds, it's not so open. Right. But the reality is not every tech vendor can do everything well. And integrations are critical for the ecosystem. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. Right now, I'm looking at kitchen display units. In my opinion, QSR is one of the stronger players in the market. Mm-hmm. But our POS provider, Toast, also has a KDS. They don't have an integration. And so I'm like, well, they have a stronger footprint in this space and can do a lot of the things we're looking for where your technology is still evolving. How do we make that happen? And the other piece is how long the integrations are taking, right? Everyone's really trying to build a all-in-one system now, in my opinion, and and hoard the business instead of saying, you know what? You do this well, I'm going to farm that out to you. We do this well, we'll take this component. And I think that's really... I think that's really the critical piece is the vendors have to come to the realization that they need each other as much as we need them. Yeah, it's, it's true. I mean, I think one of the things that holds that back is as software system X continues on their development roadmap, they really do need to inform all the other companies that are integrated because things yep. break and it becomes a never ending development work stream. I mean, I can see the appeal to have everything all in one. Um, you know, especially when you you have a system maybe that's really strong at so much, but then it falls short in one critical area. And um, I know that you just took a, a post at Toast. And so that's, I didn't mean to rhyme there, um, you know, that you, <laughs> as an advisor. Um, but Toast is great because it's so prevalent now, but there are so many shortcomings. And I say that with a positive spin. Like, I'm really excited for what comes next from Toast, but I, I'm really excited about what comes next from Toast, because you know integrating with Toast has been sort of um, unattainable unless there is enough pressure. So, like for instance, an Olo Toast situation, obviously that makes sense because Olo has the pressure to apply. But there are so many startups out there that, I mean, I've seen some out of the corner of their mouth, not publicly say, "And we're about to integrate with Toast." Don't <laughs> tell anyone. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. I mean, I guess I won't. But like. For it to be like that, I feel like that's where Toast is falling short. I mean, when you have such a huge footprint, it's like open up your doors. And of course, be mindful of who you let in those doors. But if you're going to be big and you're going to be huge, you're going to be a major player, like you got you to let some others feed, right? And integrate with you or else you're going to start to um, fall short. Um, go, go ahead. Yeah. No, yeah. It's interesting you say that because I've, in my experience with Toast, I've dealt with some of that where we've had to apply pressure. Like we really need this integration to happen. Um, not next year or Q3 or Q4, like right now. We yeah. need this integration to happen because it's critical to our business need. And they're, they're starting to come around and do a much better job of that. I think the other component we're seeing is you're seeing a lot of 
vendors either partner together or acquire that skill set instead of buying uh, building it. Right? Mm. You've seen you've seen all these partnerships now with different companies. Oh, you have product X, we have product Y. Let's come together, and now we have both, and we're stronger because of it. And then the learning, right? Like I said, yep. technology is moving at such a pace that no one can keep up. So the more players you have from different spaces, the more you can understand and innovate with technology. Yep. Yeah. And there seems to be, I mean, with those, uh, those acquisition or mergers, whichever they, way they play out, well, there's no such thing really as a merger. It's always an acquisition. <laughs> um, <laughs> but <laughs> With the acquisition, merger is a nice the, way to say it. <laughs> that's right. Merger, merger makes the acquired entity feel better. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, so you know, with the acquisitions, like let's take Brink and Punch. Well, you know, they started with uh, good integration out of the gate, but now now you've absorbed two different teams and you have to work closer together. And, and I think that needs to happen quicker. Um, you, yeah. you see it, you know, as they try to clamor ahead and try to uh, nip at the heels of some of the other players. Um, and another example is Level Up and Grubhub. Um, you know, Grubhub has developed their own online ordering system. And it's like, yep. that's great, but you're kind of screwing over everyone else. You know, and I, I've had firsthand experience with that where we tried to integrate a proprietary online ordering system with Level Up for two years, banging our heads against the wall. To where we finally said to the client, let's just finish the website and then circle back on this. And so we did. We circled back. We got on the call with the uh, the Level Up team and the team literally said, oh, no, we would never let you integrate with us. And we were like, I'm, I'm sorry, we were talking to your developers for two years about this. And you're telling me it was never possible anyway. And they're like, yeah, yeah but here's the good news. We have our own online ordering system. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, we just built one. Um, so yep. you have to be really careful with the salespeople and you really need someone such as yourself. Uh, but for other people that are listening, you've really got to have a, a tech minded person, someone who understands all this integration to be able to ask the hard questions and see through the BS because salespeople have a lot of it. Um, you know, and no, you can get into a lot of danger. <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, salespeople are going to promise you the world, right? Yeah. You want that? We can do it. You, we can build it. It's already there. And then all of a sudden you sign a deal and it's like, A, no, we can't. We don't have it. And we're not going to build it unless you yep. want to use our platform. And it's like, well, that's kind of the rope-a-dope there. And it doesn't help the industry. At the right. end of the day, it doesn't help the industry. And the industry, given the times, we're dealing with a myriad of problems, right? Labor challenges, rising cost of good costs. Recession. Uh, recession. <clears throat> A pandemic, yeah, and Lest so we forget. all of these, th yeah, all these things really have accelerated technology, but it hasn't accelerated the openness and willingness to share like I thought it would. Yeah, you know, even amongst brands, I talk to some of my counterparts all the time. Like, hey, you have the same challenge. How you're dealing with it? They're like, oh no, I got to hold that close to the vest. Like, I can't implement your solution. We're just talking about ways to solve this challenge. That's and right. I might actually make your challenge, your solution better by talking through it and vice versa. And so we really have to come to a point where we, we all work better together. And in the end, it's only going to serve our operators and consumers better. Right. It's not like someone's going to eat at McDonald's or Papa John's or Papa Gino's or Arby's every day. Mm -hmm. They're going to go to other places. So we might as well keep them coming through a, a good experience across the industry. That's right. Yeah, there's too much uh, fighting over share of mouth. Um, you know, nobody yep. eats the same thing every day, except for me. I'm weird. I eat the same lunch and breakfast every day. But um, that's a part of my meal plan. That's my business. Um, that's how you keep your skin nice. And that's right. <laughs> nice. It's beautiful. Has nothing, to, has nothing to do with this Georgia humidity, right? It's <laughs> oh. Yeah, the, uh, walk out the front door and your sunglasses fog up humidity. It's great. Um, so we talked a lot about what's coming next, but what are you excited about, um, when it comes to the, to the technology, what's on, like on the horizon that that's getting you uh, pretty pumped up right now? Yeah, it's interesting. I'm just excited for the technology industry as a whole, as it, as it relates to the restaurant space, right? It is again, the pandemic has really accelerated it. 
curbside is is awesome. You know, you're seeing 3PD. We're investing in our own website that still has our brand feel, but it's really next level to anything we've had in the past. Mm -hmm. And you guys have been a great partner there. And so I'm really excited about what's next, right? You're, you're seeing it in terms of like, there's robots making pizza now. There's robots making fries. I think um, White Castle is doing burgers with the flippy. Mm -hmm. The possibilities are endless. And if we can continue to have roundtable discussions, podcasts, these conferences where we go and express our challenges, someone's going to find a solution to it. And that's the beauty of it. You don't know what's next. That's right. Right. Lunchbox came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Toast came out of nowhere. A lot of these other POS systems, a lot of the AI components. And so I'm just excited about each day I wake up like, ooh, what's new in the, in the news? What can I read about? The Taco Bell, uh, I think it's in Minnesota, the digital Double only. It's, oh, my God. Yeah. Who would have thought about that, right? And so the pandemic has really put us in a place of acceleration. And again, the possibilities are endless. And we can make it even more endless if we actually continue to share our challenges together. I love it, man. I agree. Full, full, full on. I mean... Uh, talking together, collaborating. You said it early on in this conversation, a rising tide raises all ships. Um, and that's really what it's about. And, um, you know, I think uh, creating that brain trust is incredibly important. Um, so final question, sometimes it's the hardest one. If you had one final meal to eat, where would you eat? What would you eat and why? You know, I'm a meat and potatoes type guy. I didn't, I didn't need COVID to gain the COVID-15. But um if I had one place to eat, it would probably be Del Frisco's. I love the steak there. And it would probably be a New York strip with a bone-in ribeye. Just so flavorful. Yeah, man. Del Frisco's is awesome. Maybe I'll have yeah. to have them on the podcast next. Um, <laughs> well, okay, Kevin, th thanks for uh, thanks for being on. And uh, apologies for the technological difficulties. Um, it's always wonderful when you're talking to a VP of tech and your tech fails. Um, where can people find you? How can they connect with you? Yeah, so you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, obviously, just use my name or my email, which is Kevin Bentley at Mac.com. I'm usually on Instagram as well if you want to just see what I'm up to in the day to day when I'm coaching some of my athletes, snowboarding or with my family. I do share from time to time. And that handle is uh, KBentley57. So it's my first initial, my last name, and my jersey number. I love it, man. Thanks for taking the time out. I really appreciate this. Hey, thanks for having me. You know, just real quick, you asked earlier about where do we think technology is headed? Yeah. If someone could figure out the internet and Wi-Fi, hey, it would be amazing. That's right. Why? If you love what we served up, please follow us yeah. at Vigor Branding on Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Medium. Fork Tales is produced by the team at Vigor. Audio and video post productions provided by Zencaster. Music performed by Jet Trash and licensed through musicbed.com. Joseph handles his own hair, makeup, and stunts. Copyright 2003 to 2021, Vigor Graphic Design, LLC, all rights reserved.